Yes, this is Dr. Michael Lowry. I will be presenting the 2017 EMS update. And just to let you know, we will be following through the PDF version that we have of the procedures followed by the protocols. And this uh, is something that you can also follow this lecture by looking at the Word document that we have that goes through the uh, specific changes as well as the notes that we will be discussing here. First thing I wanted to do is go through the procedures that we will be leaving off. These are the ones you do not have to uh, be concerned about. Um, and the first one is the blind insertion airway device combi tube. This is procedure AP1. This again will be left off because the combi tube is a somewhat antiquated device that is not as successful, not as safe, uh, not as uh, easy to use as what we find with the King Airway, which will be our primary focus for a blind insertion airway device. The next item that will be left off is AP3. This is a blind insertion airway device laryngeal mask airway. Again, this is a device that is best utilized with patients that are in a fasting environment in the operating room because you can get food, particulate matter, vomit around the laryngeal mask airway, which interferes with the seal. And so we will not be using the laryngeal mask airway. The next item that we will be leaving off of the procedural list is AP3. This is the blind insertion airway device eye gel. And uh, again, the eye gel likewise is best made for someone who's in a fasting environment. As you can see here, this airway does not prevent aspiration of stomach contents. And most of our patients just got through going to the Golden Corral food trough. So this is not something we will be employing. The next procedural skill which will be left off is the airway intubation nasotracheal. This is AP7. The reason for leaving this off is this is not something that we train on. You have to have a special flutter valve or a BAM device in order to perform a nasotracheal intubation. And so this skill will be left off. The next procedural skill that will not be included is PAS1. This is parenteral access arterial blood draw. And the arterial blood gas analysis is something which is going to be best utilized in the hospital setting. And this is not something that we can actually draw blood and analyze on the trucks. And so this will not be something that we will be utilizing. The next procedural skills that will not be included is PAS-10. This is parenteral access femoral line. Again, this is a central venous access line that utilizes a much longer catheter and a specialized catheterization kit. Uh, and this is not something we're going to be employing in the pre-hospital setting, and this will not be included. Next item, wanted to go through a few specific procedural skills that we would like to review in more detail. First one is going to be AP8. This is video laryngoscopy glide scope. Again, this just goes through some specifics for using a glide scope apparatus, which I think runs about eight to ten thousand dollars for the the full apparatus that they have. And this is you know, something that there are, are several different uh, versions of it. What they don't show here is they don't show the video monitor that you'll be looking at, which comes off the camera, off the base of it, where you can best visualize the vocal cords and watch the endotracheal tube go down. Uh, in addition to the GlideScope as a video laryngoscope, there are other options out there. There's a McGrath, there's a King Vision, there are quite a few other cheaper but very effective options which are out there. If anyone wants to employ one of these devices, provided they go through 
appropriate in-service training and they're able to obtain all the you know all the necessary um, uh, implements and on the rest of the equipment they need we will fully be in support of uh, their efforts of doing some other form of video laryngoscopy but we just need to make sure that everyone is appropriately trained that is currently on duty with the access to the video laryngoscope. Again, note that video laryngoscopy is a advanced EMT and a paramedic level skill. Next item, wanted to bring up AP9. This is airway, drug assisted airway. Note that this is paired together with protocol AR3, which is the airway drug assisted protocol, uh, previously called the RSI or rapid sequence intubation protocol. And just want to make a, a note that the two of these are joined together and this goes through some of the specifics that you would need in order to perform the airway drug assisted. Uh, we will have a separate educational and certification tool that we will be coming out with so that we can have people appropriately trained and signed off uh, for performing the uh, airway drug assisted skill and note this is a paramedic level skill. Next item is the cardiac defibrillation dual or double. This is uh, CSP7. Again, note this is a paramedic level skill, but this is something that with the team CPR approach in particular, this is going to be uh, you know, something that all different certification levels will need to be aware of and need to have definitely some familiarity with. So. The idea behind this is if a single defibrillation from one vector or one direction of energy is useful, then changing the vector of energy or having an additive shock effect will be even more useful. And you know, again, we make a mention here, and this is you know something we always need to emphasize is that chest compressions are going to be consistent and only interrupted when absolutely necessary. With the pads, we note first defibrillator pads in a antero um, posterior position. This is going to be our red pads, antero posterior um, uh, position. Second defibrillator pads in a antero lateral uh, position. And so the pads definitely do not you know, need to be in contact with each other. That will potentially short circuit the machine and uh, could negate the charges. And with this, there are two separate ways that you can end up performing the dual defibrillation. Uh, option one, you basically do a double simultaneous defibrillation, and that's when the provider depresses both defibrillator shock buttons simultaneously. And so it's at the exact same time Option number two is considered the dual sequential defibrillation, and that's where the provider depresses monitor one shock button and then immediately following depresses monitor shock two button. In performing the dual sequential defibrillation, what you'll find is that the vector of energy will go from one direction to another direction, and that might improve their chance of having a successful defibrillation. Again, the dual defibrillation is going to be indicated for ventricular fibrillation or pulseless VTAC. And the dual defibrillation will be an option if a defibrillation with a single unit was not successful. As is mentioned up here, it's refractory ventricular fibrillation or pulseless ventricular tachycardia where greater than three shocks have been, uh, have been delivered uh, with unsuccessful recovery from the persistent ventricular fibrillation or pulseless VTAC. Another note mentioned here about patients having implanted pacers and defibrillators, you want to make sure that you do not place the paddles or pads directly above the device. And of course, you're getting 
a little stretched for some of your additional space that you've got available. Next item want to make a mention of PAS11. This is parenteral access intraosseous. Again, they have expanded the utility uh, of the intraosseous access now such that advanced EMTs as well as paramedics can perform the skill. Again, it would be suggested to have an EZIO, that's the bone drill uh, for this form of access, and this is a very simple, almost, almost like a carpentry type of a procedure. And we won't go through the specifics with regards to the intraosseous access. Just again, make a, a note here that the proximal humerus is an acceptable site of insertion, but you want to make sure that the arm is in a position similar to being in a arm sling where you're able to get the best access to a location one to two centimeters above the surgical neck uh, neck of the proximal humerus along the most prominent aspect of the greater tubercle. Again, for positioning, if you have the arm in a position similar to being placed in an arm sling that's successful. The other option is to internally rotate the arm and you could do that by uh, dragging tape around the thumb and internally rotating the arm gets you better exposure and, and take the tape around the thumb and tape it uh, back around to uh, internally rotate the arm or you can even take the tape and put it onto the edge of the stretcher or if you have the patient on a backboard at the time, you can use that. The advanced EMTs will end up having some specific training regarding the intraosseous access that they will have in their transition courses. Next item I want to bring up is RSP4. This is the NIPPV or non-invasive positive pressure ventilation. Previously this was known as CPAP which was continuous positive airway pressure where there was a single level of pressure which was delivered. Now this incorporates both CPAP or continuous positive airway pressure as well as bi-level positive airway pressure where there's a different uh, inspiratory pressure which is higher and then a lower expiratory pressure which allows the patient to to breathe out a little bit easier and uh, so now now we're able to perform both there is a separate quick slideshow presentation that addresses some of the differences in between the two and some of the logic behind it just a, a quick uh, note on it is that with the continuous positive airway pressure. This is something that is better utilized with your CHF patients where you're trying to continuously push fluid out and then likewise also with your drowning patients uh, that you may have that are potentially aspirated um, fluid into their lungs. Um, whereas the bi-level positive airway pressure is better utilized for patients that have COPD that have trouble being able to force the exhalation out against pressure. Again, as the slideshow will go through briefly, the CPAP is something that we want to continually train on and want to employ in the pre-hospital setting. And the BiPAP for this time will be something that we utilize more for inter-facility transports because it's more of a long-term management type of uh, intervention that we use, not to mention the fact that it is tremendously more expensive for the BiPAP devices. Please note again that the non-invasive positive pressure ventilation is now a EMT basic level skill as well as the advanced EMTs and paramedics. And the specific training for non-invasive positive pressure ventilation is something that should have been covered in the transition courses in more detail.
Next item, I want to make a mention of gastric tube insertion. Again, this is a paramedic level skill. This is USP3. And the mention here is that we should not administer charcoal in patients with altered mental status by gastric tube insertion due to the risk of aspiration of charcoal into the lungs. And the charcoal by way of a gastric tube is no longer recommended by North Carolina Poison Control. With the gastric tube insertion, of course, you can go down by way of the nasal passages, but if you have a patient that is intubated or they have significant facial trauma, then oral insertion of the tube may be considered or preferred after securing the airway. Next item is USP4. This is injections, subcutaneous and intramuscular. Want to make a mention here that you see EMTs listed also as being allowed to perform the IM injections regarding epinephrine, which can be given for anaphylaxis by the IM route. For EMTs to perform a second injection of epinephrine for anaphylaxis, they need to call into medical control prior to approval. Another quick caveat on this is while you do not see medical responder listed here, we are allowing all certification levels to administer Narcan, which is naloxone, intramuscular, as well as intranasally. And that would be medical responders on up uh, can administer Narcan intramuscular. What you'll find is that law enforcement is also able to perform a intramuscular injection of Narcan. And so the medical board in viewing the necessity of having immediately available Narcan uh, to the general population, they thought it best to relax the restriction for law enforcement and all first responders, including medical responders, to give Narcan by a intramuscular route. So while you'll see only EMTs are listed here, it may be something that the medical responders may want to also learn better and review this one procedure. Next item I wanted to bring up is going to be our last procedure, but this is perhaps the most important change that we have, and this is going to be WTP2, wound care trauma section, spinal motion restriction. Note that this is a procedure which is set up from medical responder all the way through paramedic, and it is paired together with protocol TB8, selective spinal motion restriction, which is a EMT basic level protocol, which goes through the criteria where you do not have to spinal motion restrict a patient. Again, the changes based upon research is that we do not want to be creating bed sores and causing additional problems by placing patients on spine boards. So they make a, a mention here that spine boards or similar rigid devices should not be used during transport or during interfacility transfers. They should be utilized for extrication and or patient transfers, as well as, to, uh, as support for chest compressions, but do not improve outcomes and cause significant problems with pain, agitation, anxiety, respiratory compromise, as well as the tissue breakdown along the pressure points. Now, again, while we will, are using the long spine boards less, please do continue to employ the rigid cervical immobilization collars because the main place that you're going to end up causing additional injury to a patient is if you do not appropriately immobilize their cervical spine. That's where you have more of an opportunity of motion as the head tends to roll around and bob back and forth, but the rest of the torso 
tends to maintain itself in a, in a pretty stable position once you have them on a stretcher in a supine position. So again, use the cervical immobilization collar judiciously, but limit the use of the long spine boards. Want to make a mention here that you should never force a patient into a non-neutral position to immobilize them. Uh, if you notice, especially the elderly, they basically are, you know, tilted forward. Looks like they're they're looking for change on the ground with their normal position, and they are basically due to arthritic changes and spondylosis of the cervical spine are always limited in that position where they're almost in a sniffing position or leaning their head forward. And if you straighten them out, then you potentially could be breaking their cervical spine. So always be attentive to what the patient's normal uh, neutral position is that they maintain their neck. Again, not to go into too much detail on the procedure here, but uh, definitely want you to review this in its entirety, and you can read appropriately later. But make a mention here, once the patient arrives at the stretcher, remove the rigid spinal immobilization restriction device while maintaining spinal alignment using a log roll or multi-rescuer lift technique and transfer and secure the patient to the stretcher for transport. Note that the log roll technique for football players wearing pads is not considered the ideal type of way to roll them over due to the pads disrupting the spinal alignment. In that case, it's best to use a multi-rescuer lift technique. Something else I want to go through here, and this is something mentioned in the Word document, and it's entitled the coordinated care of student athletes with potential spine injury this is a joint position statement from the nc high school athletic association and the nc office of ems again to run through some of the educational points they again make a mention about trying to get the uh, patient the student athlete off the backboard for the transport into the hospital. They make mention that athletic trainers and equipment managers are the experts in the protective equipment worn by athletes. There's discussion about the emergency action plan that should be developed from the uh, athletic team and in conjunction with EMS so that they can discuss the use of backboards, the uh, specific drills that should occur, and some of the other procedures that should occur in the event of a injured student athlete. These emergency action plan or EAP drills should occur at least annually at the start of football season, uh, and they can briefly be brushed on again at the start of each football game to review the game response and the practice field response and to know exactly where all the resources are. They also make a mention of having a system of notification for EMS to come onto the field and they suggest using a raised fist and you know, this again ought to be reviewed with the pregame meeting and EAP drill before the game. For the football player with a suspected spinal injury, they make a mention of trying to remove the face mask as soon as possible. And there can be quick release mounts, but occasionally you need a cordless screwdriver or manual screwdriver and even a cutting tool to remove the face mask. There's a discussion of the two different options regarding moving a patient while maintaining spinal motion restriction and the one option of leaving the gear on for the initial transport into the back of the ambulance and the other option of removing the gear on the field and then transporting them into the ambulance. 
of course with both options once you get them into the ambulance prior to transport you want to take the effort to remove the gear and gain better access to the patient so you can perform a better assessment of course while maintaining spinal mobilization as indicated again the recommendations go through that a log rule is no longer recommended except for prone athletes athletes that are face down there may be a, an initial log rule performed to try to bring them over but it's done with with plenty of additional assistance including the sports medicine professionals the athletic trainers and the coaches to try to maintain spin spinal immobilization and with the supine preferred method of raising a patient up to put them on a backboard to try to transport them in it's recommended to use something called an eight man lift where there's literally eight people that are are each grabbing a portion of the patient to raise them up of course with the the main emphasis being upon the head and neck to try to maintain the mobilization with rolling the patient over from a prone position onto a device which would be onto a, a spinal board so you can move them again the recommendation is to perform a log push to roll the athlete rather than pulling them over because it's a little bit better to maintain the immobilization of the spine with pushing them over with helmet and pad removal the recommendations are to have a minimum of four people if possible to try to remove the helmet and pads and they recommend a levitation method of having the rescuers at the following positions and that would be at the helmet at the neck and one at each shoulder in the word document there's also several links to YouTube videos as well as other links to different uh, protocols as well as the Nath National Athletic Trainers Association sites with regards to some of their specific recommendations this is the end of the 2017 EMS update regarding procedural changes the next item will be discussing the protocol changes This is Dr. Michael Lowry. I am going to be going through the 2017 EMS update. This is specific to the protocols for paramedics. There is a different version to go through for the EMTs as well as the advanced EMTs and also the medical responders. Again, there is a Word document that you can look at for specific notes that we will be reviewing and some of the specific changes. We will also be going through these on this PDF version that we have of the treatment protocols. Note that this version is the latest version that we have, but the North Carolina Office of EMS has not yet, as of this date, on November 27th, 2017 has not yet made the final modifications and changes in their protocols so if you print a copy make sure it's a working copy do not print any final copy uh, out quite yet because the treatment protocols are still undergoing some very minor revisions by the North Carolina Office of EMS again if you look at the protocol index you can see all the listed protocols they've redone the wording they've got an introduction they've got universal protocols that are color coded and light green as we go through there are airway respiratory section is light blue and airway cardiac section is dark blue and the adult medical section olive green adult obstetrical section is dark purple trauma and burn section is red
and then we get into our pediatric cardiac section which is light purple pediatric medical section gray blue toxic environmental section is gold special circumstances section is black and special operations section is gold one thing to make note of is while there's a separate pediatric cardiac section there is no separate pediatric airway section and for that one you just go to the airway respiratory section light blue where you see the pediatric protocols are specifically listed out here one good thing about the index is you can go through the index to get to your specific protocol faster. Uh, the first one we're going to be reviewing is UP3, abdominal pain, vomiting, and diarrhea. Notice if I click on it, it goes directly to it. The main thing to mention with this protocol, again, is for the patient that is having nausea and vomiting, you want to employ Zofran as fast as you can. And the idea being that if you can get a Zofran ODT, an oral dissolvable tablet, into the patient absolutely as fast as possible, you're going to have a response usually within, within a, a minute or so with the sublingual absorption. And you'll have a significant improvement so they're not vomiting on you while you are trying to start your IV, and if you're unable to get an IV established, sometimes the patient arrives reporting significant improvement in their nausea and uh, vomiting, and they end up not needing an, an IV because they're able to tolerate PO fluids just because the Zofran has been started earlier. The mention here is that Phenergan is left off in the standard approach. Uh, Zofran, of course, is the safest, uh, basically is non-sedating, the side effect profile is almost non-existent. If you don't get a response from Zofran, then you go with Reglan, which is metoclopramide. And Reglan has got better side effect profile and is less likely to cause tissue necrosis at the IV insertion site in case there is a infiltration of the IV. So while we do still have Phenergan, it is mentioned here as optional, age two and up only, and a mention here again is when giving Phenergan IV, dilute it with 10 ml of normal saline and administer slowly as it can also harm the veins. A better option is to infuse the promethazine in a 100 ml bag of normal saline over 10 minutes, and that's 600 ml an hour for 10 minutes. And that way you're going to see if there's any infiltration into the vein and see if there's any complications or dystonic reaction where they get twitchy and start acting goofy. Next protocol we want to review is UP6. This is the behavioral protocol. Again, want to go through and review the options that we have for medications and trying to control the patient that uh, is having some type of a uh, excited delirium where we go directly to Versed and note the maximum doses that are listed out here and you've got IM versus, versus intranasal options and then for age appropriate use you have half the dose as mentioned here. Uh, for ages greater than 12 we're utilizing Haldol. Note that Haldol is IM only. Previously the state had it listed as IV, but it is a black box warning by the FDA for IV administration due to cardiac uh, arrhythmias and prolonged QT intervals. And so it's only IM, age greater than, than 12, and then a reduced dose for ages greater than 65. You can, of course, repeat it as needed. And one mention here also is that we are not using Geodon, that's also called Zeprazidone. And the reason is, is the Geodon is too slow of an onset for our needs, as well as it being much more expensive. What you'll find with the Geodon, after an IM administration of a single dose, you're going to reach a peak effect, typically about 60 minutes after the dose.
whereas with IM Haldol, your peak serum concentration is usually reached at about 30 minutes so that you're able to get a faster onset with the Haldol, which is certainly going to be of interest to us in the pre-hospital setting. Mention here uh, about the paramedic level evaluation and screening for mental health and substance use protocol. The, they make a mention of the CIT paramedic only, and that is a crisis intervention team paramedic. This would be potentially an outreach for community paramedicine if we decide to go that route. And this is something that's currently employed in several counties that have got significant resources to contribute to that effort. And it actually is you know, yielding some pretty good responses in trying to help out the behavioral patients and to try to uh, keep them appropriately controlled and sometimes to keep them from needing to be transported with the additional assistance of other mental health resources in their regions. So currently not something we're doing here, but it is something that we may look at in the future. Next item wanted to bring up UP11. This is the pain control protocol. Note that we have removed aspirin and nitrous oxide as two options. Uh, aspirin for pain control could be a limitation due to the tendency for aspirin to promote bleeding. And if you have somebody who has abdominal pain, that could always be a gastrointestinal bleed and you don't want to use aspirin if they have a headache they could have an intracranial bleed you don't want to use aspirin so we've limited the use of aspirin seeing how we have other good options available again we've got the you know ibuprofen and Tylenol at the basic level and then we get into the advanced EMT toradol dosing and uh, note note the uh, maximum dose for IV is less than the dose for IM, and then we've got a pediatric dose. We have also got other options with regards to our opiates that we can administer. We have fentanyl and uh, repeat dosing, and we've got morphine with repeat dosing. We also make a mention here of Dilaudid. Uh, Dilaudid is an option that's listed here. Um, you know, the only reason that we have Dilaudid listed here is because of the problem with shortages with fentanyl and morphine that are, we are recurrently seeing. So we have to have to have another option available. But you know, for simplicity's sake, if you've got an abundant resource with the fentanyl and morphine, we would rather use that than the uh, IV Dilaudid or IM Dilaudid. Another mention of again we have we do not have included the nitrous oxide again that's the infamous happy nose that you would get from the dentist's office uh, if you were so lucky long ago but nitrous in a confined space such as an ambulance can end up building up to toxic levels which can have permanent neurologic deficits and if you're interested there's some uh, reading about some of the dental assistants that have got uh, permanent neurologic damage related to prolonged exposure to nitrous and it's so hard to try to in a confined space such as an ambulance give it to just the patient without giving it to the rest of the uh, EMS crew so we're not including that at the current time. Next item want to bring up UP13 this is seizure the thing that we want to make a mention of here is that Ativan has been added to the list of potential medications that you can give to control seizures. And the reason for this, again, is because the shortages that we're seeing with the midazolam, which is Versed, and the diazepam, which is Valium. So we have Ativan listed as an option. Again, it's not as good of an option from the standpoint of the storage of Ativan. It's got a, a very shortened uh, half-life as compared to the midazolam and diazepam. And Ativan, to prolong its shelf life, they recommend uh, 
that you have it refrigerated, which is somewhat cumbersome. So again, if you're able to get the midazolam and diazepam sufficiently, I would just go with those two options. And if you're not able to, uh, then go ahead and pick up the Ativan. This goes through the dosing parameters uh, for the Ativan. Uh, again, in our policy section, we have an equivalency dosing chart that shows you know, how much diazepam, which would be 5 milligrams IV, is equivalent to lorazepam, which would be 1 milligram. So again, 5 milligrams of diazepam is equivalent to 1 milligram of lorazepam. And the chart that will be included in the policies will further go through that as an educational tool. The chart will also be used to compare the different narcotics uh, that we have in the equivalency dosing and we'll also compare rocuronium versus norcuron which is a uh, vecuronium and uh, so you, you can utilize the uh, chart for several different purposes. Next item I want to bring up is UP14 suspected stroke. Again the thing to emphasize here that's a change is the time of onset or time last seen normal is now under six hours. Uh, previously we had it at three hours and at 4.5 hours and this is again when you have someone who has got signs and symptoms consistent with an active stroke you're going to want to call a stroke alert when the time of onset or time last seen normal is less than six hours and then this will segue into your EMS triage and destination plan where you do end up sending the patient. The logic behind this change is that we now have additional therapeutic options uh, for the patients that are having the thrombotic strokes. Again, thrombotic strokes are going to comprise uh, perhaps 95% of our strokes. The other 5% are going to be the hemorrhagic strokes. And with the thrombotic strokes, one option that you have is, of course, giving thrombolytic therapy. And currently, the window keeps kind of moving up. It, it went from 3 hours, now it's 4.5 hours, and some are already pushing that limit to six hours. But again, for us, for six hours, we've increased it because we now have neurosurgical interventionalists that will go into the artery, isolate the blood clot, and literally remove the blood clot, or go in and put TPA right next to it to dissolve it. And they're extending that window where they can perform an intervention up to nine hours. Some are even discussing taking that window up to 12 hours. So we have again expanded now to uh, you know our activating our, our stroke destination plan and activating our stroke alert to under six hours. Another thing to mention within this protocol again if you have got a patient that has a systolic blood pressure greater than 220, diastolic greater than 120, after three readings at least five minutes apart. You can contact the receiving facility concerning treatment of hypertension, specifically mentioning down here, again, if the pulse is greater than 60 um, also, then you can request metoprolol five milligrams IV or IO and repeat this as needed. The thought being that the blood pressure is so high that there's either a hemorrhage or there's some vasospastic response to the extreme hypertension that is causing the blood flow to be diminished to the parts of the brain that we would want to lower the blood pressure down somewhat. Metoprolol is a beta blocker. There, this will be covered in a separate slideshow presentation, and there'll be some uh, specific uh, instruction as well as some specific uh, questions regarding the addition of metoprolol to our medication regimen. Again, want to make a mention here about 
completing the reperfusion checklist for any suspected stroke patient. Next item, I want to bring up AR3. This is the airway drug assisted protocol. Again, this will be optional in some systems. We still need to discuss this. And a couple of things to make a mention of is it's uh, currently called airway drug assisted. For those of you who have been practicing EMS for a while, you will remember it previously was called RSI or rapid sequence intubation, and has also gone uh, under you know, some, some other names in the past, but right now we're at airway drug assisted. Again, it's the same thing as RSI. Um, one thing definitely to emphasize is that you must have two paramedics on scene, and we make a, a note that ketamine has been added in. Uh, over here you can see you can either give atomidate or ketamine, and uh, the, it make, makes a mention about the potential for repeating the doses necessary. Um, again, we will go through this protocol in more depth uh, with a separate educational tool, which will have a separate certification exam. Um, so we won't go into too much detail on it here, um, uh, besides to make a mention about the addition of ketamine. and. Something else to make note of here for a patient that is dangerously combative, uh, make a, a mention that if, if you've got a need for airway management and they're dangerously combative, you've got the option of giving ketamine here as a IV or IO dose. The higher dose, this is going to be the 3 to 4 milligrams per kilogram dose or 300 to 400 milligrams of IM ketamine is an option here. It's going to have a slower onset than the IV or intraosseous route, and um, it will have a more prolonged effect likewise. But again, we make a mention that you should only give ketamine when you are prepared to proceed to intubation. Uh, ketamine may be used in the dangerously combative patient requiring airway management as an IM injection. Ketamine may not be used for the purposes of sedation only. It must be used only during airway management procedures. Ketamine will be discussed in further detail in a separate slideshow presentation, and there is also uh, part of the handout that addresses ketamine uh, that uh, also has uh, separate questions related to it prior to uh, implementation. Note also that the airway drug assisted AR3 protocol is paired with the AP9 procedure airway drug assisted airway that we reviewed in the procedural section. Next up for AR4 adult COPD asthma respiratory distress. Just want to make a quick mention here that if you do have strider, which would be more upper respiratory than more lower respiratory, there may be a consideration for giving the epinephrine nebulizer treatment. And also want to make a mention that with the magnesium infusion, we have specific instructions down here in the pearls where we state that uh, when administering magnesium sulfate, the paramedic should mix 2 grams in 100 mL of normal saline and administer over 10 to 20 minutes. Of course, you should have the patient on the monitor at the time. Next item, want to bring up the pediatric airway. This is AR5, but this also goes into AR6, which is the pediatric failed airway, and want to make a mention that in both of these you'll see a blank box here next to the paramedic skill set. And you'll see it here. This is again pediatric airway. And this blank box, what the state had as a potential 
possible a possibility of a procedure was the airway cricothyrotomy needle procedure for pediatrics and this is something that is more in line with interfacility transports for specialty care organizations that are dealing with pediatric cases the airway cricothyrotomy needle procedure is a highly specialized procedure that requires significant training usually recommended to have significant animal lab training and cadaver training and this is something that exceeds our scope of practice so this has been left off but you'll still see the the open box listed here for AR5 pediatric airway and AR6 pediatric failed airway. Next up is going to be AR7. This is pediatric asthma respiratory distress. Just to make a mention here that we also have got the magnesium uh, sulfate with a maximum of 2 grams and in the infusion over 10 to 20 minutes and they make a mention again here and magnesium for COPD and pediatric asthma cases actually seems to be pretty efficacious uh, this is not uh, something that we were initially trained on 10 to 20 years ago but has now uh, become more standard of care and in my personal practice I have noticed significant differences with magnesium um, and I, I, I'm a, a very strong proponent of its use. Next item I want to do review is protocol AR8 post intubation blind insertion airway device management and this is after the patient has had the airway secured either by blind insertion airway device or after an endotracheal tube has been placed and successfully confirmed. Mentioned here, we've got quite a few different options uh, when the patient is moving around or there's you know, evidence for anxiety or there's concern for them fighting against the, the airway. Um, one thing definitely with these patients, we need to make sure they are restrained at all times because going from being completely sedated and not moving around to reaching up and grabbing at the tube can happen, happen very quickly. So we need to make sure they're restrained physically, but then for chemical restraints, we have the options here, as you see, ketamine, fentanyl, morphine, versed, and then for long-term paralytics, the long-acting paralytics, we have vecuronium, which is norcuron, we have also added in rocuronium, which is basically at a slightly higher dose. As you can see, we've got a, uh, a weight-based dosing, and we've added rocuronium in here uh, because rocuronium is also used in the airway drug-assisted protocol, and we also are having recurrent shortages of the long-term paralytics, so we want to have more options listed here. So definitely something to review. This is especially important for interfacility transport uh, uh, patients. And then we also, for interfacility transport patients, make a mention of propofol or diprovan, uh, which is listed here. And the propofol is covered under a separate educational tool. And there's a separate uh, examination which can be performed for each of the propofol transports. And note that every patient transported on propofol needs to have that case specifically reviewed. And there's a, a feedback form which needs to be filled out. And it has to be reviewed by the medical director uh, for EMS for the, uh, the county also. Something else to make a mention of here is protocol AR9. This is ventilator emergencies. And this is a great way to try to troubleshoot what to do when the ventilator is making the dinging noise and you're trying to figure out exactly what has caused it. So this is a great algorithm to go through. Uh, you know, something else in the, the pearls to make a mention of here is the DOPE acronym which is displaced tracheostomy tube or endotracheal tube 
O for obstructed tracheostomy tube or endotracheal tube, P for pneumothorax, and E for equipment failure. So just something to review here. Just real quick for AR-10, the tracheostomy tube emergencies. Um, this likewise goes through troubleshooting on what you can do for tracheostomy tube emergencies. Just want to make a, a mention here. These photos are very useful when you're trying to figure out what you're dealing with, with a, a cuffed versus non-cuffed uh, tracheostomy and what, it, what exactly could be missing with the equipment when you are responding to the patient. Under AC2, this is the bradycardia pulse present. Just make a mention if you get down into the algorithm here and you are having to perform transcutaneous pacing, then for sedation you've got the option of giving Midazolam, which is Versed, and this, of course, uh, is something that is going to drop their blood pressure down. Of course, it's going to sedate them, but they're going to need that. But um, you do have a maximum here, and just be prepared for the blood pressure drop to either give IV fluids or agency vasopressor, which would be dopamine. or epinephrine. With protocol AC4, this is the chest pain, cardiac, and STEMI protocol mentioned here with regards to the nitroglycerin paste. Uh, we will have directions regarding the nitroglycerin paste as you will see here, where SPP greater than 100 is going to be 1 inch, SPP greater than 150, 1 1.5 inches, SPP greater than 200 will be 2 inches of nitroglycerin paste. The thing to make note of here is that transport should be based upon the STEMI EMS triage and destination plan based upon the proximity of the patient to a catheterization lab, as well as the contraindications to thrombolytic therapy being the alternative treatment option, the decision will be made uh, for exactly where to transport the patient. With regards to the patients that are having an acute MI or a ST elevation MI, a STEMI, for those that have a blood pressure greater than 120 systolic and a pulse greater than 60, recommendation is to give metoprolol 5 milligrams IV or IO, and this could be repeated per medical control or the receiving facility. Of course, the metoprolol is a beta blocker, and this will be covered in a separate slideshow presentation, but the Metoprolol reduces the cardiac demand, uh, reduces the oxygen requirements, but it also reduces the blood pressure and pulse rate for a patient that is, is ha having a ST elevation MI. And in such, by reducing the demand upon the heart, it prevents the infarct from extending and, you know, becoming worse. And it also helps to prevent cardiac arrhythmias from occurring, which is certainly of concern with a patient having an acute MI about them going into a, a fatal arrhythmia. So this is something definitely would recommend when you can, based upon the criteria. Quick mention here for Carteret County, not to go into the details, you can read responsibly with it, but uh, would recommend for all systems to try to have some form of EKG transmission into the hospital so that the receiving practitioner can review the EKG and assist in the decision about where to send the patient. Likewise, for your STEMI transports, there is a differentiation between an unstable STEMI, which is going to go to the closest location at all times, and a stable STEMI patient, which may have 
more options available to go directly to a cardiac catheterization lab, which is where you're going to get a better outcome when you look at all the data. Next item is AC5 CHF pulmonary edema. Note again that with regards to the nitroglycerin paste, we've got specifics here about how much to give based upon the blood pressure. The biggest change that we have with regard to the CHF protocol is the addition of the ACE inhibitor, enalapril. ACE inhibitor is an angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitor, and the enalapril is a medication that is very useful for congestive heart failure to try to start a reversal of the congestive heart failure symptoms uh, by reducing the load upon the heart and also reducing the blood pressure somewhat that can help help out with with reducing the uh, congestive heart failure symptoms again this is something that doesn't work instantaneously um, you're going to you know need need uh, uh, you know an hour or so before you're you're actually reaching a good peak effect but this is something that the sooner you can start it, the better off your patient will, will respond. And we make a mention here that with an allopril, it's 1.25 milligrams IV push over two to five minutes if the blood pressure is over 120 systolic. And with the enalapril, we will have a separate educational tool with a slideshow, which will discuss the enalapril in more detail. We won't cover it in much more detail here. Another mention is with regards to the CPAP is do not use CPAP when systolic blood pressures are less than 100. And should the patient become hypotensi uh, hypotensive with the use of CPAP, then remove the CPAP and treat the patient according to the proper protocol. Hopefully the systolic blood pressure will not go too far lower than the 100 systolic and you will not have to give a fluid bolus because um, the combined effect of potential nitro and enalapril and CPAP can definitely drop the blood pressure down. Hopefully when that does happen I would you know attempt to lay the patient down flat and give it a, a chance for the nitro to wear off for the blood pressure to have a chance to recover on its own so that you're not adding fluids into the patient and somewhat adding fuel into the fire. Next item is AC6. This is the adult tachycardia narrow complex algorithm. This is somewhat complicated from the standpoint that you've got the narrow complex regular rhythm branch here and then you get into the AC6 narrow complex irregular rhythm. As you go down further into AC7 you can see that you're in the adult tachycardia wide complex regular rhythm and then you move into the wide complex irregular rhythm. So one thing to emphasize with the adult tachycardia arrhythmias is always be attentive to the fact that there can be some other cause for the arrhythmia. And we always have to search for the underlying cause of the tachycardia, which could be fever, sepsis, dyspnea, you know, a uh, combination of several different factors, including anxiety. And it may be something more than just the atrial fibrillation or the wide complex tachycardia that the patient could be having. So when you are seeing things like fever with the tachycardia, you always need to make sure you address the fever and that you look at the entire picture prior to trying to treat a tachycardia, which could be secondary to some some other cause. A couple of quick quick things to mention here. Uh, again, we go through our regular medications that we have. Um, as you can read through here, the thing that's been added in uh, 
which is a new change, is we've added in the beta blocker metoprolol, and this is one that you'd want to contact medical control, make a mention of what you've already tried and what you're looking at on the rhythm before you give them metoprolol, because metoprolol, again, is going to have a little bit more of an effect of lowering the blood pressure down than you'll find with your diltiazem and your amiodarone, and then likewise your effect with the denosines can be very transient. The metoprolol is going to be a little bit more of a, a longer uh, half-life, uh, certainly, and uh, um, you want to call medical control prior to administering that. The other thing to make a mention of is if you do have to cardiovert the patient and they have enough blood pressure where they can support receiving Versed or midazolam, uh, you definitely want to consider sedation prior to cardioversion. Again, you don't want to give too much because it will drop the blood pressure down and um, you don't want to get into an airway issue, but um, certainly something you want to do before you light them up. Again, on adult tachycardia wide complex, this is going to be protocol AC7. We do not have procainamide listed here as one of the antiarrhythmic options with amiodarone and lidocaine. We have enough antiarrhythmics for the pre-hospital setting. By the time you've given both of them and you're continuing with a infusion, um, you know, you should hopefully be a, arriving at the hospital. And again, with NCOMS, it's recommended that agencies using amiodarone, procainamide, and lidocaine need to choose one agent primarily as giving multiple antiarrhythmics should require the contact of medical control. For this reason, we're not requiring procainamide to be carried on the trucks. Procainamide, however, will be an optional medication for interfacility transports. With protocol AC9, this is the post-resuscitation protocol. Make a note here that entitled CO2, ideally between 35 and 45, do not hyperventilate the patient. And also of note here, is that if the arrhythmia is converted with amiodarone, then continue 5 micrograms per kilogram per minute infusion to a maximum of 15 micrograms per kilogram per minute as needed. And also, if the arrhythmia is converted with, with lidocaine, then continue 20 micrograms per kilogram per minute infusion to a maximum of 50 micrograms per kilogram per minute as needed. Next item, want to look at AC10, which is target temperature management. Note that we have this listed as optional. Uh, currently, you know, no requirement that we have, and currently there are no receiving hospitals that we have which are going to be continuing the, the uh, hypothermia protocol for post-resuscitation care. And basically, if they're not going to continue it, then we have no reason to initiate it. And, and some of this is based upon the recent studies that uh, demonstrate that there is no improved neurologic outcomes with pre-hospital initiated cooling. And, you know, whereas some of the early studies that they had thought there may be some utility with, uh, with pre-hospital cooling, now they're uh, stating that in the post-resuscitation phase, they're really not noticing uh, very much of a change. Now, if a receiving hospital wants to institute the the cooling procedures and we can certainly start them currently again none are doing that within our catchment area but if we were to initiate it again the most we would do is expose and apply ice packs to the axillary region and groin areas to start the cooling procedure uh, any other equipment to uh, pre-hospital cool the patient beyond this is extremely expensive and takes up a lot of space but uh, so right now this one is listed as optional and we will not be implementing it at this time unless one of our receiving hospitals changes their approach with therapeutic hypothermia 
and the post resuscitation phase. Next item is AC11, which is a team focused CPR. Listed here is optional. Actually, this, this one is going to be required. This has also been referred to as the pit crew CPR, and the thought is that staying on scene and maintaining continuous compressions is going to be preferable for the patient's outcome uh, versus you know trying to move the patient and trying to initiate uh, transport uh, prior to having a return of spontaneous circulation uh, or running the resuscitation efforts uh, to the full extent until uh, resuscitation efforts are discontinued on scene. So when the team focus CPR approach is instituted, we can quote that there is a chance of survival that goes up from 7% up to close to 50% with some studies of having people uh, you know, have a return of spontaneous circulation and the improvement in the, the discharge neurologically intact rates goes up to 33% in some studies. So this is a very dramatic improvement just based upon keeping them on scene and focusing on compressions. And the realization is that there's really nothing that can be done in the hospital setting that cannot be appropriately done in the pre-hospital setting with team-focused CPR and running the resuscitation efforts right there on scene. And that's certainly something to pass on to the family and um, you know, likewise to nursing homes, other facilities that may have some, some question about the approach. But as you can see with the protocol, there are specific duties assigned to the providers which are showing up and it, it has a, a hierarchy of how, how to implement this and, and systems that have also engaged the fire department uh, first responders as well as even law enforcement first responders. They're seeing a very good support from these groups and uh, quite a few different personnel arriving to assist in this effort and being able to rotate through the compression cycle and keeping you know people fresh so that the uh, the providers are not fatiguing during the course of these resuscitation efforts that can sometimes run up to an hour on scene depending upon you know how the how the uh, patient is responding and of course if we're going to be performing the resuscitation on scene, we always have to be wary of the fact that at some point we have to be able to let go and and basically terminate the resuscitation attempt uh, on scene. And so we go to AC12, the on scene resuscitation termination of CPR. This again is going to be required. And this goes through the algorithm on what to do and when to terminate CPR and then when to contact medical control and one thing to make a point of here is again the end tidal CO2s if the end tidal CO2 level is very low then that means there is no longer perfusion there's no longer you know uh, you know air exchange that you know on the a cellular level where carbon dioxide is being produced and you know of course if you're absolutely certain that you've got an appropriate airway to make the air exchange and the end tidal CO2 is going to be less than 10 then you know that there's no chance of recovery at that point now if the end tidal CO2 is greater than 10 then you know it's it's worth continuing on at this branch point of the algorithm and certainly following the end tidal CO2s, you know, the, the higher level or the closer to normalization that, that you're going to get, the better off the patient's going to, to end up being because the perfusion is going to be better. Next item is going to be AM1. This is the allergic reaction anaphylaxis protocol. And again, 
we have mentioned here about the histamine 2 blockers that we have uh, listed out here. This is going to be at the advanced EMT level. And we have uh, C pearls below for info. This mentions the three different options. And these are all same efficacy that can be used for the histamine 2 blocker. You've got the, of course, Pepsid, Zantac, and uh, Tagamet. We have the three different options because there tends to be shortages with regards to the uh, ordering of these medications. So we uh, have this listed out. And again, even though there, it's, it's the same efficacy, notice the 20 milligrams of the Pepsid, 50 of the Zantac, 300 of the Tagamet, but they're uh, equivalent. Some, something else to make a mention of is the epinephrine, the 1 to 100,000. This is going to be for the administration uh, IV um, uh, that is supposed to uh, occur over 10 minutes and, or until symptoms resolve. And this just shows how to mix up the 1 to 100,000. Um, and you can just go through the instructions here. Um, and this is, of course, in a, in a patient with severe anaphylaxis who is not responding to epinephrine IM and fluid resuscitation, then IV epinephrine should be administered. You take the epinephrine 1 to 10,000 and draw out 1 ml, which is equal to 0 0.1 milligrams of epinephrine. And then you dilute this 1 ml of epinephrine 1 to 10,000 and 10 ml of normal saline in a separate, a separate syringe to yield epinephrine 1 to 100,000. And then you administer 1 ml each minute over 10 minutes until the symptoms resolve. And for the the epinephrine given IV, this is going to be a paramedic level intervention. Also note that EMT basics can give epinephrine 1 to 1,000 as a IM injection based upon the protocol, but if the epinephrine has to be repeated, then they need to call into medical control to repeat the epinephrine. However, here you'll see the advanced EMT can repeat the epinephrine as a IM injection. Next item I want to mention AM2. This is the diabetic adult protocol. And basically this goes through the algorithm of what to do for the different levels of the patient's blood sugars. Something to make a mention of if the blood sugar is elevated, it makes a mention here about giving a normal saline bolus. Again, I would look at the entire aspect of what's happening with the patient because you could have your congestive heart failure patient that has got a blood sugar in excess of 250 and giving a fluid bolus could worsen their congestive heart failure symptoms. So um, just always look at the contraindications prior to performing the intervention. As we make a mention here, if, if somebody is able to tolerate PO for hypoglycemia, then you uh, could, you know, give, give them either juice or some uh, oral glucose or something. Um, if they uh, you know, are extremely alert, you've got the capability, you could also give them food, but it's going to be a little bit slower to respond than juice and the uh, oral glucose solution. Quick mention here. Uh, in the pearl section is when you give D50 or oral glucose or give you know any medications or perform an intervention for that that uh, matter, then you must contact medical control for advice prior to obtaining a patient refusal. Remember that there is a reason that the patient was hypoglycemic. It could be they're on too much medication, be it insulin or their oral hypoglycemic medication. Uh, could be that they're going into renal failure and they're not able to clear the medication or the insulin out fast enough because their kidneys are holding on to it longer. It could be, you know, weight loss. You know, whenever somebody loses weight, their diabetes improves. But if they lose weight and they haven't adjusted their insulin dose, they're going to end up being persistently hypoglycemic on a you know, regular basis. 
you know, it could be something as simple as not enough food or calorie intake, but you know, very commonly there can be more to it. The other thing that you can uh, it can affect the body's response to uh, consuming calories and the the way the body maintains its blood sugar is infection and sepsis. It could be a UTI or some other process which is affecting it. So the thing to keep in mind is when you correct the sugar, you got to still explore the possibilities as to what has happened and contact medical control can help to sort that over because medical control could give some specific recommendations about uh, changing the medication regimen and reemphasize to the patient the need to follow up the next day because if you don't take those steps, the next shift will end up probably taking your patient in for the hypoglycemic episode. And it's not unheard of to see EMS go out three and four days in a row uh, for a, a recurrent hypoglycemic episode until they can either finally convince the patient to come in or they, you know, the patient's hypoglycemic long, long enough that they can't recover fast enough or they're seizing from the hypoglycemia. So again, always contact medical control to ask for their expertise uh, and, and advice to uh, counsel the patient about being transported in or making a change or getting in immediately to see their regular practitioner. Next item is going to be AM3. This is the dialysis and renal failure patient. And something to make a mention of here is for the patient that is in cardiac arrest, they make a mention of giving calcium gluconate or sodium bicarb. And the, the thought is this is for possible hyperkalemia, which you can reverse with the calcium and with the sodium bicarb. Um, and you know, it could be hyperkalemia combined with acidosis, which it very commonly is. Something else, as you see further down here, they also make a mention where you've got peaked T waves, which is a sign of hyperkalemia or a widened QRS complex, you also want to look at giving calcium gluconate or sodium bicarb. Next item is AM4, which is hypertension protocol. Again, not to go into too much details regarding this rather simple protocol, which basically sends you everywhere else, but just a, a take home point here is hypertension is usually transient and in response to stress and or pain. And a common thing that that I've always done when they show up in the emergency department, unless they're having a hemorrhagic stroke or CHF or having chest pain, which sends you to other algorithms. If it's just hypertension, usually the best thing to do is a quiet dark room and turn the TV on to something very bland. And what we find is most of the time the blood pressure normalizes. So, you know, our blood pressures go up and down during the day and certainly stress and lights and sirens can end up making it go up. So not overreacting to the hypertension is sometimes the best thing to do. Next item to cover is AM5, which is the hypotension shock protocol. And just something, this is very good in trying to obtain your, your history and formulate your differential based upon your signs and symptoms to try to separate whether or not the patient is in cardiogenic shock, something related to the heart, hypovolemic shock, you know, whether or not they're dehydrated or they've, they've got significant blood loss, distributive shock as to whether or not they've got some type of a allergic reaction or sepsis or something which is causing their blood vessels to dilate out. And then we've got obstructive shock, which we make a mention of here, obstruction. obstruction. Um, here they're, they're talking about more of a tension pneumothorax, but you can also have obstruction related to an aortic dissection or some other vascular obstruction. So it's a good, good thing to kind of provoke your thought process when you're looking at the, the, the different things you're going to collect and the different parts of the, uh, the history to try to formulate a response. And of course, here we have a mention of giving a fluid bolus, 
um, you know, based based upon um, the the uh, shock, and then administering dopamine as a vasopressor to try to reverse the hypotension that the patient may have. But keep in mind the dopamine can have a uh, bad effect long term upon the patient's kidney function, so you want to try to resort to the dopamine as more of a last resort if possible. Next item is going to be AM6. This is the suspected stroke activase TPA protocol, and this is designed for interfacility transport patients where activase or TPA has already been administered prior to transport. So this again is more of an interfacility protocol. But as we make a mention here that blood pressure control with a systolic blood pressure less than 180 and diastolic blood pressure less than 105 is important to prevent postlytic intracranial hemorrhage. What I quote to patients uh, is when we give thrombolytic therapy, there is a 6% chance of them having an intracranial hemorrhage following the administration of the lytics. And again, not every hemorrhage kills them. Sometimes it's a little pinpoint uh, area of hemorrhage, but again, 6% of them can end up hemorrhaging after lytic therapy. So paramedic interfacility transport units should have labetalol available when taking patients that are post-lytic treatment. And what you'll see here is after uh, given the thrombolytic therapy, if the blood pressure is in excess of 180 over 105, then you give labetalol 10 milligrams IV or IO. Um, other options that are available is nicardipine is another option. And again, labetalol and nicardipine are not required for pre-hospital EMS units, but should be something that would be considered by interfacility transport units and preferably maybe something that the the uh, transferring hospital will provide uh, if necessary because it's not something you're going to end up using frequently. Next item is going to be AO3. This is obstetrical emergencies. Big thing to make a, a note of here is, you know, for seizures that could be occurring with the the pregnant patient. This is something that goes with eclampsia or the preeclamptic state and, and pregnancy-induced hypertension. But we make a mention of the different options that we have available here, which the midazolam, which is versed, diazepam, which is Valium, and then Ativan if we are unable to get hold of diazepam and midazolam, as we mentioned before. These are the options that you have immediately to control seizures. But one thing that we do want to do to try to prevent seizures as well as to control the blood pressure and prevent arrhythmias and to reverse the eclamptic or preeclamptic state is to give it magnesium. And this is 2 grams IV or IO. And instead of a slower infusion, where we're going over 10 minutes, we're going over two to three minutes, and then you can repeat it times one. Again, a lot of protocols that are in OB suites um, is to give magnesium up to six grams IV, um, and they commonly will give it over the course of, of several minutes. So us doing two grams IV with a potential repeat dose is still not considered a very high dose for the eclamptic seizure patient. Next up is TB3. This is crush syndrome trauma. Mentioned here with regards to the interventions that we have. Um, certainly when you're going, going through the protocol, if you get sent to another protocol like multiple trauma or thermal burn, then you want to go there for pain control. Once you somewhat maximize them on pain control, if they need something else for anxiety, the paramedic intervention here with Versed or Midazolam is available. And also make note here that usually, especially if they're entrapped, they're, they're going to have a 
significant fluid deficit most likely from fluid loss into the damaged tissues or just dehydration because they haven't had any oral intake in which case you're going to want to be very aggressive uh, with the uh, the fluids as is mentioned here but keep in mind if they're entrapped less than two hours you're going to do one liter per hour IV and if they're entrapped longer than that you have to be careful not to give them too much fluids and so you go to 500 mLs per hour of course responding to hypotension as necessary note here that with abnormal EKG um, again the concern is acidosis and hyperkalemia where you're having your peaked T waves your widened QRS greater than uh, 0 0.12 seconds or three boxes or your prolonged QT or of course loss of P waves um, or significant arrhythmia you'd want to try to reverse the acidosis and hyperkalemia by giving sodium bicarb or calcium gluconate another option is albuterol has actually been shown to uh, reverse the hyperkalemia although the effect is very minimal and next up is TB6 this is the multiple trauma protocol and as we go down the big change with this is that if the patient has abnormal vital signs poor perfusion uh, have has evidence for a significant blood loss a consideration is TXA or transexamic acid which is one gram IV over 10 minutes it's either IV or IO and in the pearl section we go into more detail on it but we also have got a separate slideshow which goes into further detail on the TXA and there's some questions that go along with that but make a mention here that bleeding control must occur before IV access and we talk about the permissive hypotension where we're shooting for a systolic blood pressure of 90 in trauma patients with suspected hemorrhage because when you give too much IV fluids it reduces the temperature ever so slightly that disrupts a coagulation cascade likewise too much fluids dilutes the platelets and dilutes the coagulation factors and then also the blood pressure being too high tends to promote bleeding and can literally kind of blow the clot off of areas that are trying to trying to uh, clot off the source of bleeding so with the TXA again we, we're covering this in another section you can read responsibly on this with regards to the indications with blood pressure less than 100 systolic heart rate greater than 110 and other you know signs for uh, for shock for hemorrhagic shock and then they make a mention of the contraindications and some of the other parameters next up want to bring up the TB8 this is the selective spinal motion restriction protocol and this is paired together with the procedure WTP2 spinal motion restriction that we went through in detail again you see with the changes whereas this previously was only a paramedic protocol now it is a EMT basic level protocol and algorithm where EMT basic can follow through the questions and answers and proceed down to the point of not employing any specific spinal motion restriction here and more specifically with the changes they have taken out the age 65 or greater or age 5 or less which was one of the other branch points in the algorithm and the realization being that you should be able to get a reasonable enough exam where you can rule out a spinal cord injury with these ages but be wary that age 65 or greater is very very likely to have some type of a spinal injury with a very minimal mechanism
and likewise your H5 or less is going to be somewhat scared of you during the exam and may not be able to be trusted. Also something different is previously they just mentioned significant mechanism of injury. Here they're giving you more specifics of high energy events such as motor vehicle ejection, a high fall, and abrupt deceleration crashes would be things that should constitute a significant mechanism of injury. So again, we make mention here that long spine boards are not considered the standard of care in most cases of potential spinal injury, that spinal motion restriction with cervical collar and securing the patient to the cot while padding all pressure point areas is appropriate in most cases. The big take home on this is when in doubt, stick on a C collar. Nobody is going to fault you on that one and that way you can enact some spinal motion restriction, but you do not have to go with the long spine board. Something else with regards to the distracting injuries here, if they have some other significant injury, they may not be paying much attention to their cervical spine injury. And likewise, if they're intoxicated, you in essence really can't trust them. Got to stick a, a cervical collar on them. Next up is TB10, traumatic arrest, and this is one that we will employ. And the key thing with this protocol is you notice that for over here for blunt arrests, if they are apneic and pulseless, and they are in asystole or PEA less than 40 from a blunt arrest. There's basically nothing that can be done for them. Their chance of recovery is zero. For penetrating arrests, however, you go through the same algorithm, you know, apnea, pulseless, and asystole or PEA less than 40. But if they have pupil reflexes, or as you see here, any, of course, spontaneous, which is spelled wrong, body movement, then you proceed on to the cardiopulmonary resuscitation procedure. Next item is PC5, that's the pediatric tachycardia protocol. And just a mention under the cardioversion procedure, We make a mention here of the the jewels to employ, and then they make a mention of the midazolam dosing that you can administer if their blood pressure will support it, so that the cardioversion is not quite so traumatic for the uh, patient. And of course, we have adjusted the doses. Some of the the state's level dosing I thought was a little bit too extreme with what they were giving. So we've adjusted most of the uh, Versed dosing, the midazolam dosing here and in some of the other protocols. With the concept being that you want to reduce anxiety, but you don't want to launch into the advanced airway protocol uh, when you blunt their respiratory response. And still, cardioversion, while it is painful, is also very brief. Next item is pediatric ventricular fibrillation and pulseless ventricular tachycardia, and this is PC6. Just want to make a mention again down here in the far right corner. We have magnesium sulfate, which is 40 milligrams per kilogram IV or IO over one to two minutes for persistent V-fib or pulseless VTAC or torsades to point. Uh, you can repeat this every five minutes if you need to, to a maximum of two grams. The other thing which we have added in is we have given a little bit better dosing parameters for amiodarone and lidocaine um, with regards to 
what your maximum is and and as the algorithm reads it's basically you start with your amiodarone and if you have refractory V-fib or pulseless VTAC at that stage then you would start up your lidocaine would be next and this of course follows with the PALS algorithm under PC7 which is the pediatric post resuscitation as we have here you've given a antiarrhythmic um, and they have successfully been resuscitated then we have a mention here of what infusions you're going to want to continue to keep them from going back into another arrhythmia and so this gives the dosing parameters utilized if the arrhythmia is converted with amiodarone or if the arrhythmia is converted with lidocaine Next item is PM1, which is pediatric allergic reaction. And basically this follows similar to the adult allergic reaction with regards to the H2 blocker being utilized and the dosing parameters, which are weight-based here. And then we again talk about the way to make epi 1 to 100,000. And then, likewise, there's a mention here about EMT basics require medical control order for repeat doses of epinephrine 1 to 1,000. Next item is PM2, pediatric diabetic. Again, we go through some of the different parameters similar to the adult diabetic algorithm, except for keep in mind less than one year of age you're giving d10 one to two years of age you're giving d25 and greater than two years of age you're giving the d50 so if you aren't carrying the d10 and d25 then you can this shows how you can make d10 out of the d50 or make d25 out of the d50 Again, want to make a mention here that when you do give D50, D25, D10 oral glucose or perform any intervention to try to recover somebody's blood sugar, then contact medical control for advice prior to obtaining a patient refusal, especially with the pediatric cases. This is going to be something very important. Next up is going to be TE1, which is bites and envenomations. And one thing to make a mention of here for muscle spasms, that the protocol allows for midazolam, which is Versed. And the dosing that we have listed here is a little bit less than what the NCOEMS protocols allowed. Uh, as I thought their dosing was a little bit too high for just mere muscle spasms. And if you look at it from the standpoint of insect bites causing muscle spasms, the only one really which is of note is a black widow sp uh, spider bite, which can end up causing muscle spasms. And while Versed would be somewhat effective, the actual true antidote is calcium chloride for a patient with a suspected black widow spider bite and moderate to severe muscle spasms. Next item is going to be TE3 drowning protocol. What we have done is added into the purple box here, into the free text box uh, regarding a dive accident or barrow trauma, which is the bends to call the Divers Alert Network with their phone number here to go ahead and initiate a case and to get recommendations. Also make a mention here about consider CPAP for the responsive patients with near drowning and also to keep patients with suspected arterial gas 
embolism supine. Those are the ones who may have the bends and could be having either significant difficulty breathing from the bends or chest pain or having stroke-like symptoms. Previously, there was recommendations to lower the head or turn them on their side, but now they're just saying keep them completely flat as best you can, and that's going to be the best thing for a arterial gas embolism. Something to point out here for the drowning patient that is awake but with altered mental state and for the unresponsive patient from drowning, they mention under both of them to give five breaths by BVM or mouth to mouth. And of course here is going to be as tolerated because they may be altered but not so altered that they will allow that to happen. Another point here to make a mention in the pearl section here is that foam is usually present in the airway and may be copious. Do not waste time attempting to suction. Ventilate with BVM through the foam, but then suction the water and the vomit only when present. Also make a mention here that spinal immobilization is usually unnecessary. When indicated, it should not interrupt ventilation, oxygenation, and or CPR. Next item is TE4 hyperthermia. This is just a reminder here in the pearl section. As is mentioned here, rapid cooling takes precedence over transport as early cooling decreases morbidity and mortality. Again, the goal temperature is about 102.5 degrees Fahrenheit. The thought is take whatever steps you can to try to cool them down as soon as possible until you get to that point prior to taking the efforts of, of initiating transport. So those methods could be preferably an ice water bath that you may have some difficulty obtaining. The other option is cold wet towels below and above the body or spraying cold water over the body continuously. Of course, taking the truck temperature down as low as you can also would help. Next item is TE5 hypothermia and frostbite. One thing that we have added into the free text section here is attempt warmed IV fluids not to exceed 100 degrees Fahrenheit. Next item is marine envenomations injury. This is TE6. Again, make note here with jellyfish, anemone, and man of war injuries about immobilizing the injury, lifting away tentacles, do not brush or rub, and applying a vinegar rinse if available, otherwise washing and cleaning with seawater, but not putting fresh water or ice upon the wound, as that could cause the nematocysts to burst and cause a worsening envenomation. What we're seeing with the overdose and toxic ingestion protocol is that NCEMS is returning and emphasizing the use of charcoal again. And this is mainly for Tylenol, for aspirin containing products. Uh, there's also beta blockers, calcium channel blockers, and then tricyclics down here. If in time of ingestion is less than one hour, then you want to give activated charcoal one gram per kilogram. There is some argument with regards to narcotics and with benzodiazepines, which have a slower time of passage from the gut because they slow down gut motility. There's some logic about giving charcoal over one hour, and that may be a consideration with discussion with medical control. But in general, if time of ingestion is less than one hour, the faster you can get the charcoal on board, the more of an effect it's going to have to bind up what they've taken. So I would try to do it as absolutely soon as possible. Again, the 
recommendation to give charcoal down a NG tube or down a G tube is not going to be recommended if there's a concern for aspiration. A couple other uh, things with charcoal. Um, again, dose one gram per kilogram with a max of 50 grams and patient must be alert and able to protect their airway and safely swallow in order to receive charcoal. Charcoal is ineffective against metals such as sodium, potassium, and lithium and alcohols and glycols. It is also not recommended for ingestion of corrosive chemicals such as acids and alkalis. If in doubt about the charcoal, then contact medical control. Next item is SO1, which is Scene Rehabilitation General. And this one's going to be required. It, it is not just optional. And that one also goes into SO2, which is Scene Rehabilitation Responder. And just real quick with regards to these protocols is these protocols help to provide some guidance with how to treat the first responders that are responding to fires or to certain disasters or inclement circumstances. A couple of things to point out. If the heart rate is greater than 110, then obtain a temperature. If they are under some type of a heat or cold stress, notice that for both of these, you will employ rehydration techniques. And then you also see that after 20 minutes of general rehabilitation, if you reassess the vital signs, the cutoffs are a heart rate of 110 or a temperature of 100.6. If you're not less than 110 or less than 100.6 and you've got to extend the rehabilitation until the vital signs improve and the patient improves. We make note here that carbon monoxide monitoring, if indicated, they make a mention that the carbon monoxide level has got to be under 10%, as well as pulse ox has got to be greater than 90% for them to return. Other mention here is that you have to remove all their PPE, body armor, hazmat suits, turnout gear, and other equipment so that you can get a full assessment prior to allowing them to return in for participation in the, the scene event. Something else to make mention of here in the Pearl section is the general indications for rehabilitation. A 20 minute rehabilitation following use of a second 30 minute self-contained breathing apparatus or a 45 minute self-contained breathing ap apparatus or single 60 minute SCBA cylinder. Also 20 minute rehabilitation following 40 minutes of intense work without an SCBA. And the general work rest cycles, 10 minute self rehab following use of a single 30 minute SCBA cylinder or performing 20 minutes of intense work without SCBA. Again, in SO2 scene rehabilitation for responder, very clear. You can follow down the algorithm where they've got the pulse rate, if it's in excess of 85% of the National Fire Professional Association standards, which they have listed over here, or if you, you find that they are not meeting their blood pressure parameters, if they're greater than 160 over 100, or the respirations are less than 8, which would be kind of surprising, or greater than 40, and then the pulse ox less than 90, that's carbon monoxide level greater than 10, or if they're with a temperature greater than 100.6, then this necessitates fluid bolusing, mandatory rest, and reevaluation after additional rehabilitation. 
So that is the end of the paramedic portion of the protocol review for the 2017 EMS updates. There are additional slideshow presentations to review regarding non-invasive positive pressure ventilation, as well as the new medications which we are introducing. And there will be a question set with examination that will need to be taken also to show that this has been reviewed and that you are proficient with using the new medications and protocols. Thank you again for your time and efforts.